And we'll make a decision on the United States Supreme Court, the new justice. That'll be made over the next few days, and we'll be announcing it on Monday. And I look forward to that. I think the person that is chosen will be outstanding. President Trump speaking about that nomination for filling Kennedy's seat on the Supreme Court. We all eagerly anticipate uh, who he will choose. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it with our guest right now, Austin Peterson in studio. Thanks for coming in. Hey, Annie. Hey, Tony. Yo. How are you doing, St. Louis? Breaking in the brand. You you don't know this. Yes. That, that you are the first person to use that microphone. Oh, it's right. a brand new microphone. And the we, good news is, is it's actually working. It's we were working. Wondering. We, <laughs> <laughs> we're like, well, we'll see. It's an experiment test on the kid. <laughs> It had only sort of been tested, so oh. the fact that we can hear you is a really good sign. Can you hear me, St. Louis? <laughs> Hello, testing. Testing, one, one two, two, three. Yes. Uh, so President Trump gets yet another Supreme Court uh, nomination, Ooh. and Claire McCaskill, boy, I I don't know how she makes her decision on what She's to do here. She's got to for it. She's got to. It's going It's got to happen in October. Claire's so smart. She knows what she's got to do to survive. She's a survivor, man. She Yesterday she was being interviewed and she was saying she was the underdog in this race to, mm-hmm. <laughs> in this race despite her massive fundraising advantage. You know, she she was asked what she thought about her two Republican opponents and and she was talking about me and Josh Hawley and she goes, "Well, I'm the underdog in this race. I don't I'm not discounting them. They're two very smart articulate men and I was only offended because she forgot handsome <laughs> <laughs> maybe next time yes <laughs> maybe uh, we can get her in here and we could ask her which is the most attractive <laughs> yeah opponent. Josh versus Austin who you want country boy or the <laughs> Ivy League <laughs> yeah I I mean I'm watching how she is going to handle this and I think it's the worst thing that could happen to a lot of these red state Democrats that are going to face election if they don't vote for President Trump's nominee, they're going to lose any moderates that would, you know, are looking forward to having a, another nominee of President Trump's on the Supreme Court. If they do vote for it, they're 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 alienating people either way. Yeah, I want to put put us let's put aside our short term political interests and look at this in the long term because that's what what matters here. The future of the United States is at stake. The future of the court. Um, and I've looked at Donald Trump's short picks, and there's there's pluses and minuses to each and every one of them. If I were the president of the United States and I had that short list, obviously I would have had Judge Napolitano on there, my buddy. But <laughs> but barring that, I you know Senator Mike. Lee is a powerful conservative, a strong defender of the Constitution. You know, yes, he's in the Senate, so you would lose that vote. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that's a drawback. However, we would get another conservative from Utah. I don't worry about that. But what I think is important is is that Mike Lee would defend our freedom. He would defend our rights. And for the rest of my life, I'm young. I want to see somebody in there who is a constitutional conservative the rest of my life. And I, I heard Ted Cruz was actually the reason that he was put on there. Mm-hmm. That's a good sign. That's one of us. Part of the, you know, one of us, the tribe. <laughs> you know, Mike Lee's one of us. And uh, I think it would be a huge stroke. And I think it's, and it, it, with Gorsuch and with Mike Lee, we're looking at shaping the court conservatively for decades now you know it's funny Annie Tony you know some people call me a rhino but then Susan Collins <laughs> is out there saying I won't vote for a judge unless they don't want to overturn over the state unless yeah. for abortions <laughs> Come on, guys. Like, uh, you know, just because I believe in a little more freedom than you do, you right. know, it doesn't mean that I'm a rhino here. I'm a true conservative, and uh, we need a good conservative pick. Mine is Mike Lee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Is he? I don't know if he made the short list. Yeah, uh, the shorter short list or the short list? The 20, he's on the 25. That's, okay. yeah. yeah, he's on the 25. I don't know if he's on the shorter short list, but I'm holding out hope because you never know what could happen. when. Well, as soon as the political games come into play, you'll never know who they'll filibuster or try and stop. Sure. You know, or they'll try to filibuster because they can't do that anymore. So, um, you, you you talk about a, con- a constitutionally conservative court. What does right. that mean? Essentially, it, it means two things. I think it, it means that the it's a basic understanding of the Constitution at the time it, that it was written, but also a broader understanding of what the end of the War of Independence tomorrow, Fourth of uh, July, the most American of holidays, that we understood that it wasn't just us declaring our independence uh, for a, a political order, but an understanding that of the, a Declaration of the Rights of Man. Uh, does does your constitu- a constitutional conservative, someone who acknowledges the rights of man, the Constitution expresses uh, our rights. It acknowledges our rights, but our rights don't originate from the Constitution. That is constitutional original originalism, uh, that the government cannot disp- deny or disparage these rights that are intrinsic, natural rights. Uh, that's what a constitutional conservative is to me. So um, I wanted to ask you also about immigration. I've oh, seen boy. I, now. <laughs> yeah, I'm asking. Yeah, I'm, go- I'm going there. I see people getting a little up, up in arms about your 
comments and positions when right. it comes to immigration, open borders, oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You tell me. Sure. Where do you stand? Yeah. So I think that we should have the power to control our borders. Problem, of course, is that we've ha- we have had bad immigration law written since the late 1800s when we first started writing it. We didn't. The founding fathers only gave the feds power over naturalization. So how you would become an American citizen, not how you would get here. So we've kind of had mass migration for quite some time here in the United States. Illegal immigration is a relatively new concept. And we have some court precedents that have been set that are problematic. We don't know if you're born here. If you're born here, that's what makes you an American citizen or if your parents uh, exclusively or what make you an American citizen. That hasn't been defined by the courts yet. So we do have a little bit of legal trouble. Ab- Abraham Lincoln, you know, this is the time when the anti-immigrant center- sentiment started to rise with the know-nothings. Abraham Lincoln once famously said, if you want to get a bad law repealed, enforce it completely. Enforce it to the fullest mm-hmm. extent of the law. Uh, President Trump did that, and then he turned around and signed an executive order because his predecessors had been doing something wrong. But of course, the Democrats didn't call out Obama when he was doing it. Uh, I, <laughs> Wait, I, believe, I believe in a security <laughs> check, a disease check, uh, before you come here, like the Ellis Island years, that's not open borders. Uh, just because I don't want to, to give away American civil liberties or engage in a massive undertaking for eminent domain, which is not conservative, um, I, I I think that the federal government destroys everything it touches in general, and they waste cash, and they spend more than they project on projects. I think we can have border security without creating a massive FDR-style public works program on our southern border. You know, it'll probably take at least 20 years to just steal up all the land through eminent domain, and most people don't know. The president, if he serves two terms, it's only eight years. So the question is, is do you want a yes man to go to Washington, D.C.? Because a yes man is not an honest man, uh, and I'm running against a lot of yes man, and and uh, they're willing to say whatever it takes to win or to have power. Uh, I'm not willing to lie to the people of Missouri so that I can exercise arbitrary authority over them. Uh, and so I want to make sure that everybody understands what the economics of the situation is. You know, you can't have a horde of people coming here, becoming undocumented, perhaps spreading infectious diseases. But if there is a hurricane in Texas and people want to spread south, remember walls that can be built to keep people out can also be used to keep people in. I don't feel like going through a checkpoint if I'm trying to get the hell out if something happens, if I'm on the border, you know, celebrating on the Rio Grande for whatever reason. Uh, you know, Texas, that's two-thirds of that land is privately owned, uh, either privately owned by the states, so the federal government has to come in and do all the taking up of that. Uh, I don't I don't relish or have glee in the government coming in and using eminent domain to take up people's property. So yeah, I think an Ellis Island-style protocol, you know, maybe some, some centers where people can come and be processed. Everybody wants less illegal immigration. I want no illegal immigration, mm-hmm. none, zero. But that means you have to make legal immigration simpler. Would, Some people want to get rid of immigration overall, meaning they want fewer people. But if you want fewer legal immigrants, you're going to get more illegal immigrants. Mm-hmm. That's just supply and demand. So would you vote for or against President Trump's wall? How about how about this? I'm going to use my first compromise, political compromise. I'll vote for it if you give me if you let me abolish three cabinet level agencies. How's that? Huh. Or how about I want to cut 10% of the entire federal budget. I want to repeal the entire Department of Education. I so wanna... it sounds to me like when it comes to the wall, uh-huh. it would be a compromise to you to vote for well, the wall. Well, how about this? I'd let I'd let the states decide. Maybe the original the original Amen. migration patterns came through the states. The federal government didn't have the authority. Remember, they it was the court cases that were were uh, uh, that were out there when we were trying to stop the, these the Chinese from coming. You know the the reason why there's so many Chinese restaurants in the United States is because the Chinese Exclusion Act had a, an exclusionary act that you, if you were Chinese and you owned a business, you could stay in the United States. Mm-hmm. And of course, we had to stop Italians and Irish from bringing Catholicism to the United States. So, you know, that is dangerous, right? Remember, we were worried about the <laughs> yeah. Catholics taking over. But maybe if we'd stopped those Italians, <clears throat> we wouldn't have that Italian in the Senate race trying to take my job. He's trying to, those Italians <laughs> trying to take our jobs. I'm an American. I was born here in Missouri. He's trying to take my job, that Italian. So, so the problem is, is that when you really have a real frank discussion about American history and immigration, it makes people uncomfortable. It bothers mm-hmm them. And and also, most people don't learn economics in, in high school or college. We don't teach it anymore. Uh, so I think we got a problem on the southern border. I want to solve it. Uh, but check out the beat while the DJ cuts government. <laughs> <laughs> Cut government slash welfare. Kill the welfare state. End the war on drugs federally. That's billions of dollars going south, hundreds of thousands coming north because of an unconstitutional federal war on our own people. A bloody war. 
uh, on our own people, which creates the gangs, which creates the violence. Uh, but of course, we're not willing to address that. We want to put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. Mm-hmm. So uh, regarding abolishing uh, federal agencies, there's been a rallying cry now from the left. They're, 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 they're so co- hot. They're collective. <laughs> they're collective. So hot right now. The collective co- rally cry is to abolish ICE. I'm sweating and it's not just the weather. I mean, it, when so people talk about abolishing federal agencies, people are mad because like, I want to abolish federal agencies, but it's like, I want to abolish more federal agencies. I want lots of federal agencies. Let's get rid of, give me four or five more. And uh, the, the, it was only created recently, right? It was INS before. Uh, and I think the, the Department of Homeland Security has the TSA. Let's just go for the, the entire Department of Homeland Security because then we get rid of the porn of gropes at the airports. Nobody likes having their children felt up or groped at the airport by these Not creepy crawlies. Nobody oh, likes the TSA. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, you know, in theory, of course, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we don't have border patrol. Mm-hmm. Right? That doesn't mean we, have, we don't have border security. It doesn't mean that we don't have immigration and customs services. Uh, it just means that we don't, you know, do no-knock raids and, and destroy the civil liberties of American people because, you know what, your security actually isn't more important than our freedom. Did mm-hmm. you know that? Did you know that? Because we're, right now we're crying, we're screaming for, for security. Save me from the threat on the foreign border. Take all my freedoms, government. Yeah, no-knock doors yeah we shoot your dog how many people here in st louis have had their dog shot by cops i'm sorry to get a little bit wild here but i'm just sick and tired of conservatives praising big government it's okay when we do it it's not okay when we do it one of the questions i think a lot of people have about your immigration policy Mm -hmm. you check background check disease check then that person comes into the country what rights do they have when they walk across are they american citizens are they able to vote what happens when they cross the border and they're here now? So if you're an American citizen and you don't have an ID, if you don't have due process, they can deport you back across. The, you, you've been drinking too many tequilas. You lost your passport in <laughs> Tijuana and you want to come back to the United States. If we don't have due process rights, then American citizens can get caught up in that dragnet. That's mm-hmm. what I meant when I was talking about abrogating the civil liberties of mm-hmm. American citizens mm-hmm. here. Uh, so the 14th Amendment, we've, we had this little altercation in the late 1800s. They called it the Civil War. Uh, and we, <laughs> we passed this constitutional amendment. It was the 14th Amendment, and it says that any person in within U.S. jurisdiction uh, cannot be denied due process. Uh, so, yes, due process means you can't have your life, liberty, or property taken from you uh, without due process. So that's an issue. Um, I think that, um, if anything, the fever pitch that's, that's boiling up right now is, I think, that an acknowledgement that the United States has been doing the wrong thing for mm-hmm. decades now, and that we've accepted it. And, uh, you know, uh, constitutional rights, no, you can't vote if you're not an American citizen. Of course you can't vote. I I believe in voter ID like we have here in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you if it takes 15 to 25 years to become an American citizen, people are going to break the law. That's the the unintended consequences of the of the mishmash of immigration laws that we have. People say, well, just enforce the law. But we're a nation of laws poorly written and randomly enforced. Uh, And so unfortunately, we have to change the laws to make it simpler for people to come here, do a security check, a disease check, uh, pass a citizenship test. Can you speak English and then get a work visa? Uh, um, but some people don't want that. They don't want it because they think they agree with Karl Marx that the surplus labor, they're taking our gerbs and that that and they, they've they've swallowed the economic fallacies of the left of Marxism. This is why Bernie Sanders freaks out over people uh, uh, who want to lower the minimum wage because the surplus labor is bringing the wages down. Uh, they don't understand economics. Uh, the free market economists all agree with me. And I'm a conservative. And if you're for bigger government, well, to the left with you. I want to ask you a real quick question because there's nothing you can talk about quicker than trade I'll and tariffs. It. Sure, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, there's a lot of, of, you know, trade war tariffs being placed mm-hmm. coming in and going out. What do you think about this administration's approach so far? Part of me is just secretly, desperately hoping that it's true that he is the 3D underwater chess master. <laughs> um, and because he had a diplomatic masterstroke at the G7 summit, they were all calling the president a protectionist and, and shouting him down. And Justin Trudeau and Angela Merkel. And he turned around and looked them in the eyes and crossed his arms and said, I will drop all barriers during international trade. And if you will. And mm-hmm. they were they started choking up. Right. Like Claire McCaskill yeah. on a ham sandwich before Joe Manchin steps in and cracks a rib. Right. Like the, the, the people were shocked. I was shocked uh, because he, I think deep down maybe the president knows free trade is is good for the United mm-hmm. States that brings prosperity and wealth billion lives saved because of international free trade and capitalism I got the the facts to prove it the economist you can search that out um, and it, to me I think that uh, free trade is good uh, read your Bastiat uh, here's a funny thing about protectionism so if imagine you're a manufacturer of candles or lamps 
well, you can't have all this free sunlight coming into the studio <laughs> right now. So maybe the government should just force us to close the shades because that would actually create jobs for candle makers, mm-hmm. right? Uh, now we see because of this little simple anecdote uh, written by Frederick Bossy out in the 1800s. He's a French legislator, a classical libertarian, liberal, you know, conservative at the time. Uh, that the, we've, we've been fighting these problems for decades. It's mercantilism. Uh, we pay the taxes. Claire McCaskill's in, in southeast Missouri laughing her butt off of the Republicans who have flipped on trade so, because people are losing their jobs. Mid-American Nail Company. Uh, they're losing jobs. They say that they'll say they'll create 27,000 jobs from the tariff, but they don't tell you that we're going to lose fi- almost 500,000 jobs because the tax increase, we pay that. The taxes are on us. Yeah. Well, Austin Peterson looking to unseat Claire McCaskill in November. We are loving this primary. Tony can't get enough and of it. And there is a primary. Did you guys yeah. know there's a primary? Oh, yeah. August 7th. Okay. Oh, yeah. And if you support Austin Peterson, you need to make sure you get to the polls on August 7th. I'm looking and, forward and to the primary up. probably more than I am the general. Did yeah. you guys see the Missouri GOP trying to rig the game yesterday where they made that I rule change? That story. So they're now going to openly donate to Josh Hawley. It was like a really sneaky maneuver. The executive committee did it without the, the regular committee mm-hmm. of Missouri. They had no idea. Idea. But it's kind of fun because I get to be the underdog, and now everybody's calling us up. And I thought and Claire McCaskill was the underdog. No, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, the corruption. How did you end up being the front runner after all this? <laughs> you know, you know what is funny is that I am the guy who can beat Claire. Um, the thing is, is that they're trying to disenfranchise voters, uh, and the, the establishment would rather lose with someone that they can control than win with someone they cannot control, like myself. Mm. Uh, but they're going to face voter apathy this November if Josh Hawley doesn't do something quick about the grassroots. All he would have to do is debate me. But frankly, I'm sick and tired of it because why would I want to argue with a conservative status when I can argue with the Democratic status? Claire, it's time. You and me, baby. <laughs> I'm up 16. Josh is losing by six. This smart, articulate man is ready to debate Claire McCaskill in the state of Missouri. What do you think, St. Louis? Annie? Tony? Uh, we will Claire be there. Claire Austin? We will be there it. with bells Fire on. Fire Claire, uh, baby. AustinForSenate.com. Yeah, at AP4 Liberty on Twitter. Anything else that you want to promote specifically? God. Yeah, let's There's make a, a donation. Let's kick the Republican establishment's butt. Let's send Mitch McConnell back to Kentucky, and let's go fire Claire McCaskill and save some save some money, tax money and tax dollars, and fire Claire and restore freedom in the United States. All right, we'll be right back with your phone.